God has designed life to be a dance. God has a part, and we have a part. Figuring out what is God's to do and what is ours to do is how to make the dance elegant. A lot of people in our parish are gardeners, and one parishioner lives on a corner where everybody gets to see the fruit of the labor. He's got a huge garden and he works on it all summer and a lot of the neighbors love watching it develop from the first turning of the earth in the spring, through all the planting, through all the weeding. And there's a section of it that has beautiful flowers and another section of it that's got so many vegetables by August he doesn't even know what to do with them all. So there's people that go by that route all the time. Some of them on their way to work. Some of them are joggers or walkers. And one woman who walked by every day of the summer and watched the garden closely took her earbuds out one day in August and said, wow, what a glorious harvest the Lord has provided for you. And he said, yeah, but you should see how this garden looks when God is the only one doing any of the work. Cooperative effort. Gardeners know that. It's not God alone. It's God with us. It sounds nice. It makes us feel perhaps a little bit pious when we say, oh, everything depends on God. And in the final judgment, that's true. But remember, because everything depends on God, that means God was able to set up the world any way that God wanted. And God set up the world to involve us having a role. God invites us to take our part in the unfolding of the world. That's what the stories are about today. Samuel heard a calling in the night and it took him a while to figure out who it was and then just a little bit longer to figure out what to do about it. Samuel was young and Eli was old and had been on a faith journey for a longer time. And so he had to teach him that he needed to say to God, you're the one giving the instructions, just speak. I'm the one in charge of doing it, so your servant is listening. Speak, Lord. I don't have the plan. You've got the plan, but I've got the boots and I've got the garden gloves. You speak and I'll do it. If we say that, that's the moment when we get out of the driver's seat and give God the wheel. It's a big moment. If we mean it, then we're really allowing God to take control of the direction. And there's a lot of stories of people who've done that and have been surprised at what happened next. I was at a conference this summer and got to hear Rabbi Glenn Jacob tell his story. He was the rabbi of a big congregation on Long Island for years and years. Very large, active community. He was a very well-known rabbi. And then in 2012, Hurricane Sandy came. Superstorm Sandy, I think we called it. And it leveled his house. He was one of the people that lost his house completely. And when it was clear that that was part of a new breed of storms that was going to change life for a lot of us, he realized, I think God is calling me to do something. My house got destroyed. That's got to be a sign. So he was trying to figure out what to do. Should I do a preaching series? Should I do a bunch of Earth Day activities? And then something totally unexpected happened. It turned out that there was a board of directors that were forming a faith-based sustainable energy company that was going to avoid using energies that deplete the earth and find sustainable ones. And it was a faith-based thing. And they decided that they needed a clergy person to run it. And so now, Rabbi Jacob is the executive director of the New York Interfaith Power and Light Company. He doesn't have a congregation anymore. He said, I can't believe it. God took the wheel, and the next thing I knew, we turned down a street 
I had never been anywhere near before. He never expected it. But he said, strangely, he knows he's right where he's supposed to be. What we hear in the gospel is that God never lunges for the wheel. God never grabs the wheel. God is not pushy. God is not going to edge you out of the driver's seat. That is only an invitation. It is totally up to you and me. God never grabs for the wheel. We hand it over. And that's what we hear when Jesus says to those first people that are watching him and hanging out, looking at him through the bushes, lurking behind the pillars. Who is this guy? And when they finally get the courage to go near him, he immediately says, can I help you with something? I can tell that you're interested in, in knowing more. What, what, what would you like to know? And they said, what's your deal? And his invitation is very simple, not pushy. Come and see. If you want to know more, just follow me around for a while. See what you think. In two weeks, the week that we're having our big 60s and 70s dance, that's actually the kickoff for something wonderful. It's Catholic Schools Week, which we celebrate every year. But this year, we're celebrating with an unprecedented event. It's not often that a school that's 141 years old can experience something it's never before experienced, but it's happening this year. 16 of our little kids are getting baptized. 16. Listen to this. One of them is in pre-K. Several of them are in kindergarten. A bunch of them are in second grade. But now listen to these ages. One of them is in fifth grade. One of them is in sixth grade. And one of them is in seventh grade. So you must be thinking, man... That school must really force religion down their throats. <laughs> but it's not true. In fact, this year, our statistics show that a third of our students are not Catholic. And these 16 kids represent part of that third that are not Catholic. But our way of connecting with them is taking cues from Jesus. Come and see. We don't try to force anything. We don't manipulate. We follow Jesus's policy, which was that he brought people in by attraction, not by promotion. He was not a salesman. He was not trying to seal the deal. He invited people in. There was no manipulation, no bait and switch. He would just say, follow me and see what you think. It's funny that so many religions do not take that approach. Even religions that, that follow Christ, they, they take a totally different tone. They'll say, you better do this or you're going to fry. Do you want to spend eternity in a hot place? I didn't think so. So you better join us and get on the bus. You know that tone. It's very tempting because a lot of us think that our understanding of Jesus is the only one that could be right. But we're hearing... That's not how he approached things. He said, follow me. See what you think. Not a single apostle followed him because they were afraid to not follow him. Often they were afraid to follow him because they could tell it was going to blow up their life. He was going to turn down a street that they had never been down before. If we were using coercion to get our kids to convert, if, if our kids were getting baptized because they were scared, there'd be no joy in it for us. It wouldn't feel good. But we know that each of those kids is on a journey that is between them and God. We're just so blessed that we get to witness it and experience it. One young woman, a girl who's now one of the older ones, every single time she came up for her blessing over the past couple of years have said, can we do it yet? When can we do it? And it was her parents that needed more time. Obviously not her. She was ready. So this week, the question is, are you ready? What would it look like to know that God was calling you? What are you waiting to hear? Or what are you waiting to see in order for you to hand over the wheel? Are you prepared to hear that voice in whatever form it comes? 
it's very likely not to come in the middle of the night like it did for Samuel. I mean, it could, but it, it's more likely that it might come by a feeling that you get when you read about the care portal in the bulletin. A lot of people have told me they read about that and went, all right, Lord, I hear you. It might be that you've heard that announcement about small groups. Whenever I make an announcement about small groups, I often will see someone throw an elbow to the person they're sitting with. Maybe that's an invitation. Maybe it's more than just an announcement at church. Maybe that's a real invitation. And it might be something totally different. It might be something that happened over Christmas. If somebody that you love pulled you aside and said, are you going to have another one? I'm kind of worried about your drinking. And we might say, oh, she's always worried about something, or oh, he's just trying to get the upper hand. Or is that an invitation that came out of someone else's mouth but comes from another place? It's going to be gentle if it comes from God. God doesn't lunge for the wheel. But those invitations that you get, they come with great power. It may not be a hit over the head, but when we asked our kids at school, so why do you want to be baptized? A lot of it is very simple, like, I don't want to come up for a blessing anymore. I want to receive Jesus. Or my classmates are doing things that I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a visitor. I want to be part of it. That's how Jesus did it. Attraction, not promotion. Invitation, no hard sell. Do you want to know what it would be like to hand God the wheel? Come and see. 